So Dean, I don't know if you want us to move into the next. Okay, so in keeping with the topic of child health research, I'm pleased to introduce, uh, and I hope I get the, your surname correct, Annette, Dr. Annette Majnamar and Ms. Carrie Costello from Child Bright. Child Bright's one of the spore chronic disease networks, and Annette and Carrie are going to speak about the Child Bright experiences with patient oriented research. Uh, Dr. Majnamar is an OT, occupational therapist with doctoral training in neuroscientists, neurosciences and scientific co-director of Child Bright and Carrie Costello is the implementation support coordinator for Child Bright. So I'll turn the session over to Annette and Carrie. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I did want to start off today just by acknowledging that I am joining today from Treaty 1 territory on ancestral lands, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Ininuak, Ithinuak, Denusaline, Anishinuak, Inui, Dakota, and Nakota peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. As a white person who has come to this land by choice, I do want to acknowledge that I have privilege based on the color of my skin. I appreciate all the custodians of this beautiful land and water where I now live, work, and raise my family. So we're getting started today talking about the Child Bright Network, which is basically a network that looks at children with brain-based disabilities. Um, so that's our priority. We work with both the, uh, the, the youth and the children themselves, as well as the parents. Um, so we are funded by SPORE and so are very uh, interested in patient experiences as we work through. So we wanted to start off with how not to do it. Um, so go ahead, Annette. Hello, my name is Emma and I'm 13 years old. I've been involved as both a participant and partner in research. Uh, I've been a partner for one project where I felt I was not being heard. Uh, there were four youth and two parent partners, and I felt that the parent partner's opinions valued more than mine or the other youth. Um, and I felt like the researchers did not care much about what we thought. So just to be clear, this was not actually from a Child Bright project, but I think it's important to think about because it is super easy for this kind of thing to happen in any project that you're working with youth because a lot of it is about power. And power really um, is how are you using it and how do you actually sort of try and figure out those power dynamics and try and make them not as obvious. And I always say this because when you're talking about youth, it's not all about training and capacity building. It is about the environment. It is about how you're doing that work. So what makes the right environment? It's someone's job. <laughs> and it, is, it really can be as simple as that. They are good at it. They have time for it. So when you're building that team, if you are looking to work with youth or children or parents for that matter, really that there's somebody who you are looking at the team and going, do we have somebody on the team who can do this work? Patience is a big part of it. Support is a big part of it. But if there is nothing else you remember from this presentation, it is don't say no. Even if the answer is no, don't say no right away. Don't justify it. And I know that's a hard ask because when you're walking into a group of patients, you have done a lot of work. You have potentially started to write grant applications and come up with ideas and done a whole scoping review and done research. You're walking in with a lot of work done. But the minute you say no, especially in a group of young people, the whole room will become much quieter. So really, really don't say no right away. Even if eventually the answer is no, that's okay. You can explain why it's a no, but really check yourself and don't justify. Hear what they're saying and consider. Be curious. Ask questions if you're like, okay, I'm not sure what they're solving for. Ask questions to get below the surface and what are they solving for? Because then maybe you can find a solution that will work for you and for them. So really a couple of things just walking into, how can you ask questions without leading? Because youth will more likely be say yes if you ask them a question that is sort of leading. They'll go, okay, yeah, that sounds fine. Really opening it up, being clear that, uh, that how do you make patients, especially youth, part of the whole project, not just the parts that you think you need them for. 
So that is also a super interesting question to really think about as you move forward, especially for people who might not understand all the parts of a research project, but how do you involve them in ways that are meaningful, but kind of are outside of what you might normally think, oh, that's where they'll come in. I'm gonna throw it over to Annette to talk about some winning strategies. So I'll briefly summarize some of the strategies we're using um, to promote patient engagement at ChildBite. Um, and these strategies include um, aspects of structures, processes, outcome measurement, and raising awareness. So in terms of structures, it is critical that we really have the voices of our patient partners to guide us and to be instrumental in, in informing decision-making with us. So they are members and sometimes lead um, different uh, committees. They're involved in our executive and our steering committees and in all of five of our program committees. One committee is, um, one program is a citizen engagement program, and there are two committees that are really critical to our network. There's a citizen engagement council, which uh, involves predominantly parents of children with developmental disabilities, and our national youth advisory panel, which are youth with disabilities. And these two groups really guide and support patient-oriented research in our network and come up with strategies along the way as new issues evolve. Um, for example, they're involved in ongoing measurement of patient engagement. They are uh, enhancing the diversity of our patient partners, both youth and parents, and they develop tools as we need them. For example, most recently relating to co-authorship. In terms of processes, we have a parent liaison who is a uh, part of our network and in fact, that's Carrie, who's really awesome. <laughs> and uh, the parent liaison is really there as a mentor and uh, helps to support parents on a one-to-one -one as they learn about patient engagement and their particular role. So if they're struggling within their research team or their committee, or the, uh, this is very important um, when we're onboarding new patient, uh, parent partners. We have our compensation guidelines, which continue to evolve. So it's an iterative document developed by our youth and parent partners. And so they're, we're constantly adding and revising to this document as new activities and new roles emerge. For example, most, more recently, we had the role of a co-principal investigator for a parent partner or looking at compensating young children and what would be a meaningful compensation to them. We have a matching tool for those that want to join the network or are, on the, are involved in a research project but want to do other activities within the network, and we um, look at their skills and experiences and match them to where we have new needs for parent patient partners. We have a consultation through our National Youth Advisory Panel and our parents with lived experience. So that's ongoing within the network, but we now have an external uh, service. So our youth provide consultation to childhood disability researchers across the country that want um, input from a youth's perspective. And our parents are now doing the same consultations externally as well. And of course, we have multimodal approaches to training patient-oriented. Uh, research. Outcome measurement is critical, um, like how are we doing? So we do have quantitative measures, the community-based participatory research and the public and patient engagement evaluation tool that we've used, um, completed by researchers and patient partners. We also um, look have done interviews of patient partners and researchers to dig a little deeper in terms of uh, understanding the engagement experience. And overall, there's a very positive um, response in terms of the quality of engagement, the, the impacts, um, how satisfied it is, how beneficial it is from perspectives of patient partners and researchers. Um, however, in the qualitative, we really wanted to dig a little deeper about barriers and facilitators, about perceived impacts, and um, we also want to understand, um, you know, if there are some solutions or some challenges that we need to overcome, and how to involve patient partners not only in their project or their program, but in the network at large. We also did a survey to see what the impacts of the pandemic were on patient engagement. 
and some of the areas that we improve or are improving upon based on this ongoing measurement is to make us more flexible in the ways we engage patient partners and parents and youth are quite different in that respect. The importance of um, communicating on an ongoing basis with patient partners, particularly during the data collection phase, which can extend for quite a long period where not much happens. So really reaching out, providing updates and thinking about the next steps and involving patient partners in the planning of the next steps. And finally, um, there was this need to enhance the diversity of our patient partners. Finally, um, you know, we're privileged to be a SPORE um, chronic disease network um, that is building capacity within our network membership on patient-oriented research. But we also have a responsibility to take that expertise and, and enhance it across the country in child health and uh, research more, more globally. So the, in addition to you know, our traditional ways of disseminating and sharing information, speaking at different levels together, uh, researchers and patient partners together, uh, whether it's for families, um, for clinicians, for researchers, for community members, uh, it's, uh, we really seek out every opportunity to do this and to use social media uh, to, to really push the message of patient engagement. We are now building a child health patient-oriented research toolkit for clinician scientists in pediatric hospitals and rehab centers as well in, uh, in partnership with Passerelle. Okay, so we're going to focus a little bit more on some of the tips and tricks specifically with children and youth, although some we touched on earlier. First of all, just you need the right equipment. Um, one of these. Uh, a work one. I have two. One is my personal, one is my work one. And it's super important because when you're dealing with youth, I don't actually email them very often. Or if I do email them, I send them a text saying, I just emailed you, check your email. Because I will tell you, I do not get email responses from my youth. Um, and just a plan. Childbrite isn't able to do this, but if you can pay youth within two weeks, it is much more likely they will show up at your next meeting. So really thinking through some of the, those logistics. And um, and I worked in a university environment and we were able to do that. So it was difficult. We had a lot of meetings with accounting, but it's possible. So really thinking through some of those logistics and really sowing the right seeds right from the beginning. I'm not going to go through all of these, but one I'm going to highlight is don't have judgment built in. This is super difficult with five-year-olds because we come in with sort of a set of assumptions of knowledge. I'll tell you from uh, some of the sibling work that was funded by Childbright is that one of the psychologists talked about how a five and six-year-old, when they're a sibling of a child with a brain-based disability, are worried about they're going to catch that brain-based disability. That's their biggest concern at that age and stage of development. Not something I ever considered to have to talk to my other kiddos about. So really taking a step back and checking that judgment. No right or wrong answers and not looking for agreement, saying that over and over again, just to make sure that people really feel free to have open conversations and dissent. And then plan to leave the more sensitive questions for later. Um, so we can move the slides there, Annette. Um, and really this is, super important, ask permission to call on people. This is very important if you have a group that is youth and, and parents or youth and other adults, because oftentimes the youth won't feel comfortable sort of cutting off or jumping in. So making sure, and I always, if I have a two hour meeting, there might be three or four super important questions that we go around the room. I ask permission first and make it clear they do not have to answer, but I wanna make sure they have a moment to answer, to think, to put in their thoughts, because sometimes they're not going to jump in. And then, um, all right, we will leave uh, the last talking about youth with Emma. Go ahead. Hi, it's Emma again. So normally you should keep youth and parents separate as a rule, but there can be some exceptions, like when a parent is a translator or support person. But try and avoid youth and their own parents on the same research project. Other parents are fine, but when it's the youth and their own parents, it gets a little bit awkward. Never ask the parents what the youth thinks or ask the youth to contradict their own parents or other adults. 
give feedback to the youth about the changes they made and are making in the project so we know we're heard. Summarizing information, including the youth's suggestions, is always important of what you heard at a meeting. And sometimes ask the youth first, because the parent often takes up a lot of space in the meeting unless the youth is given the opportunity to speak. And I, because I am a parent partner, I'm going to pass it back to Annette to talk about what it feels like to work with parents. So, you know, we, we're very fortunate to have two very distinct patient partner groups. We have our youth and we have parents and other caregivers and other family members. So the parent or, and other caregivers are different in terms of their perspectives and their lived experiences when compared to youth, but equally important. Um, it, it really enriches our understanding of the health condition and the healthcare experience. But parents are really different from youth. They they think beyond the moment and really look to the future, thinking about, I mean, these are children who happen to have a disability. So children are developing rapidly and they're constantly changing with new roles, new challenges. So parents are thinking several steps ahead and, and this influences uh, what their unmet needs are, or their perceived needs are. They also really consider not only the patient, but also the whole family. So what are the unmet needs? What are what are uh, the ways we need to do research to consider the impacts on the child and the family? So I just want to leave you with some tip sheets that we have developed by our patient partners. So this really provides detailed descriptions of how to best prepare yourself, whether you're a parent, a youth, or a researcher on how to get involved in patient-oriented research. We also have three blogs that re uh, relate to the some of the measurement aspects, the quantitative, the qualitative, and the pandemic. Um, I encourage you to sign up to our newsletter so you'll be updated on training initiatives and other tools and products that come our, our way to what you can benefit from. So just want to leave you with uh, an acknowledgement of our phase two um, funding partners and in these are mostly children's hospital foundations across the country. And I also want to highlight the Azraeli Foundation, which is funding six postdoctoral fellows uh, each year. Thank you. We'll be happy to respond to questions if there's time. Thank you, Annette and Carrie. Uh, and I'll take any questions. So we, have, we have time for a few, couple of questions, I take it? Yeah. A couple of quick questions. So. If there are any, uh, we, there's there's no, it's not up here. Anybody? Apparently, everybody knows everything already. Nobody needs to know anything more. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of uh, recurring messages uh, over the day um, as we learn together. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, we have one quick question. Am I messing with the schedule? Uh, just a quick question. I'm curious, you know, you engage individuals in a project. So my name is Anil Bhattacharya, I'm a family physician, clinician scientist. And so you build relationships with those people. That's come up multiple times. But you actually want to reach a bunch of other people. And who is it? Is it on the patients to have a big network of people that they tap so they represent perspectives other than themselves? And I'm just curious how you've built that out, let's say, in the example of Childbright, because you know what you're describing, I thought, is actually the most sophisticated and complex use case of patient engagement. So it's, I'm obviously clearly lots to learn from you. You start, Annette, then I'll go. <laughs> Um, well, I think the first thing is um, it's important that each research project have several different voices because every voice will be unique, will have a different lived experience. So the diversity of experiences is important, will we'll collectively enrich your understanding of the condition and the, 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 the navigating the system. So most of our projects will have five to ten patient partners. Um, and that also puts less pressure on patient partners that they don't have to be involved in every aspect, depending on what's going on personally in their lives, um, because there often are difficult moments where they have to step away and then 
may come back, you know, six months later or whatever. So um, having a diverse group of patient partners is helpful. We, for example, when developing an intervention that was quite complex, a coaching intervention, we started with our patient advisory group for our project. But then we developed um, an, an online survey that was developed with our parent partners. And we did, they helped us design it. And it was, we, we made so many mistakes. Like it was incredible how helpful they were in designing that survey that was meant to validate are we, the intervention that we're doing, is it really tapping into the right content, the right format? And so that was sent out to over 250 other parents through sampling, you know, reaching out to different people that everybody knew, and they would reach out to others. So, you know, there was a way to extend it out to 200 plus voices to get um, some uh, greater input. So, you know, using the um, the uh, networks of each family is amazing and uh, very helpful. I'm going to jump in there, Annette, because my child bride also funded a project that me and another parent did about leaning on your patient partners to get other patient partners and to get participants and how that can be fine and also be problematic. So I'm going to be super practical for you. Um, I think that when we were looking for a more diverse audience for the CEC, we actually engaged a specialist uh, and we targeted Facebook groups. Um, specifically that were communities that we were looking to engage, that we did not necessarily have people already involved. And we ended up with the most diverse group we've ever had. It was incredible, diverse in terms of, you know, we have someone from Northern uh, Canada, we have, you know, a hugely diverse audience, uh, like citizen engagement, but it took us going actually outside of the networks of the people that are in within us. So I think that I know that's hard to do on a little project, easier to do in a large network, but it is sort of thinking outside the box. And if you are, you know, if you're looking for, you know, Facebook groups are actually really popular for parents with children with disabilities for sure, but also with a lot of other things, reaching out to some of those um, larger networks, disease networks, things like that, putting it in their newsletters, like a lot of that work will get you quite far in terms of finding patients that you might not have direct contact with or that your families are, won't have direct contact with. And you could use our consultation service. Uh, that is true. <laughs> we have our matching tool. <laughs> More consultation, yeah. Thank We're happy. You. Thank you, Shelley. It'll have to be a quick question. Do you have time? It depends on the question. Okay, okay. I'll try to make it brief. Um, we'll answer quickly. <laughs> this one's actually for you, Colin. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but I was so glad that um, Child Bright was able to share um, their experience with engaging youth. And I wonder, um, thinking about patient engagement and research and how the usual suspects are often older folks who have mm -hmm. lots of time on their hands, um, what is OCHSU doing to build capacity for more youth engagement that I didn't really hear a lot about uh, today other than in Child Bright's presentation um, to, to expand our um, engaged patients in research going forward. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good question and I'm, I'm gonna push it on to Francine because I know she's been, I think phase one was around how do we make this happen and phase two is how do we make it happen in a more representative way and part of that I think is youth. So I'm just going to hand a microphone over to Francine. Is that on? So um, one thing is it is in the planning process. So we're looking, uh, especially at sick kids, to have dedicated resources that will kind of su support um, youth engagement. We do have a children's council that exists right now. But the challenge that we found is that if it can't be sustained, if we don't have the resources to support it, then there's no point in embarking on it only for it to become a burden or fail. So what we wanna do is actually build it from the ground up so that we can do it in a way that is meaningful, um, that we can do it that takes into consideration a lot of the, the learnings that have been shared about how to engage with youth, that we find the right people to do it. And that means preparing the staff within SickKids to make sure that they're engaging youth because it's beneficial for both parties. 
and that they know what it means to engage in how much, how much resources it takes to actually do it well. So it doesn't really answer your question, but it means it's in the pipeline because we want to do it right. That's great. Thanks. And child guide can certainly help um, guiding you in the process based on the, you know, lessons learned along the way. And our youth would be amazing to help you with that. Good. So thank you, Colin. Thank you, Annette and Carrie and Emma um, for a great session. And uh, we'll now start lunch. Uh, we allowing until what, 1.15, quarter after one, uh, to have lunch, to network and catch up with folk. And if you do have a chance on the screen, there's a QR code for the survey, very quick survey. Uh, it helps us and the organizers for, for next year. Okay, so we'll be back at 1.15.